PKG Power Kits for the Canada. <laughs> okay. um, I was really pleased that you delivered on Radio Free Intel from 10 years ago. And uh, of course, the Atom guy is small to begin with, but you were about two and a half times the size of the Atom CPU. What are your aspirations for those communication circuits uh, in the future as to how they might be uh, more efficient and ratio metric? Right. Um, well, I think the you know the, the radio that we that we used in uh, in Rose Point was a was an earlier iteration. So we were sort of moving we were moving down parallel tracks, and and we've done a lot of work with uh, you know with Intel's. Uh, Process technologists to make sure that um, you know we had the, uh, the right set of features, uh, particularly high resistivity substrates and things like that. So that's that's a, an earlier radio that didn't sort of didn't have the, the full digital treatment. So uh, you know so going forward, uh, we'll run another experiment where where we'll you know bring the radio in, and obviously the the size of the radio will continue uh, continue to shrink. So. Um, you know we're, uh, you know I think we're reasonably confident at this point that you know the radio will be a relatively small part of you know the typical um, typical SOC back and um, and that we can um, um, you know uh, manage the the interference between the you know between the two radios. I mean think about uh, you know. An atom running at 1.2 gigahertz and and, uh, and the Wi-Fi radio is running at 2.4. You know, <laughs> the major harmonic is sitting right there. We uh, we actually um, uh, we actually can do active interferer cancellation, and we and we had the demo. We cut it for time, so um, you just change uh, some of the factors in the in the fractional end synthesizer, and it and it moves the interferer out of the you know, of the radio spectrum. So if that interferer was a, uh, you know, was like a processor clock or something like that, we we can manage that digitally in the in the radio. So there's there's a lot more a lot more going on than we were able to, to share this morning. Thank you. Nice work. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Jesse. Number three, Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Hi. Charlie Richardson. I think you know that. Um, Intel has been sometimes accused of borrowing IP from other firms. And I just want to point out that I was first in IDF to think about <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> I think there are photos on the Intel.com newsroom of that. So okay. if you want to have that horror <laughs> uh, Let's go with Dave over there. Number By the way, I, I tried to practice getting the ears to actually respond to the way I think it. <laughs> no, luck. no luck so far. David Cantor, real world tech. So yeah. you're uh, talking about digitizing, you know, batch slots and analog circuitry. Um, when you look at the digital equivalent of your analog circuit, uh, is there an impact in terms of power and area, uh, an overhead, that is to say? Uh, because certainly you're getting process portability, but there's some cost associated with that. I would assume. Yeah, I think Yorgos. Um, I think Yorgos said that the, um, the um, you know the the experimental um, radio, uh, you know the Moore's law radio, uh, was about you know comparable um, to the you know sort of best of class Wi-Fi radios of the uh, of the day. Um, now you know that said, uh, you know it, it we were you know our focus was on getting it to work, not on getting it to minimum power. So um, there's clearly much more. Uh, much more opportunity to, to do that, and, I, and I'm speaking of that independent of the scaling opportunities that will come, and that will and that will further drive uh, drive power down. Uh, more generally speaking, um, you know, the digital radios just have an amazing amount of control. I mean, one of the things, another thing we just didn't have time to do is um, is talk about self calibration. It was it was unfortunate because. You know, we had talked about how you struggle with analog radios. You know, many passes through the fabs. You know, tweaking you know critical analog elements. Um, you know, we can do calibration in real time. So you know, if we you know if the if the system detects drift, it can actually correct for that. You know, by just changing you know, a few parameters in the register. So um, you know, you you and and I talked about the the interferer example. So you. You you really have to appreciate 
all the additional versatility you have when you when you've got a digital design is just this you know it's it's more powerful um, than uh, than simply replacing the analog equivalent. You, it is a much better radio, and I think it makes for a much better product radio because of that that control. Thank you. Who like number one? Uh, Jack Clark says, "Dnet, how does um, stability, noise sensitivity, and output purity compare with analog radio? And how do you expect it to work with SDR architectures?" Well, I, you know, the the baseband is already um, you know is already digitized, so um, you know, I mean, it won't have it won't have any problem. I think you're operating. I mean, if it, you know, if it doesn't drive an atom processor crazy, I'm not worried about that. The baseband, but the, um, uh, but I, you know, I mentioned this uh, somewhat raucous debate at Intel um, over the feasibility of that digital synthesizer. I mean, I had senior managers at, at Intel saying, you know, digital synthesizers are the future of radio design and always will be, um, and they simply did not believe that you can build um, a competitive digital uh, frequency synthesizer, particularly a frac-in synthesizer. Um, you know, here again, this gets back to the other question. Um, uh, you know, we do, you know, we do active cancellation of the, of the spurs, and we have a demo. We didn't show it today. We have a demo, and, and um, as soon as you turn it on, um, you know, there's a 60, 60, 60 dB reduction in spur amplitude. I mean, it's really stunning. Uh, and so, um, you know, we have the we have the spectral purity, uh, both for Wi-Fi and for um, you know and for cellular. So here again, you know, the ability to on the fly dial everything in, so you know, you get maximum cancellation of the spurs. I mean, really, really does make for a better radio. And again, you know, a better radio, you know, not just in production. I'm not just talking about yield at the, you know, at the end of the path. But in the field, we believe these radios will, will outperform the best of the analog radios because they're constantly in calibration and they're actively dealing with the interference environment. Thank you. Let's go with Nathan, number three. Then we'll go to Paul. I think you had a question. Yes, yeah, thanks. I want to re echo Rick's comment about having the persistence to go on this radio free kick <laughs> for 10 years. <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> right. Uh, but my question relates to the CRAM base station uh, processing. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're doing in those servers, but I'm wondering whether you really need the kind of computational horsepower that a Core i7 or a Xeon has. Could you, in fact, use microservers to handle that kind of task? Well, yeah, I, and I think um, uh, I think you heard um, you know Sunny make the comment about you know running a large number. Of uh, base stations on a, on a you know on a single server you know hundreds and probably in a few years even thousands of, of base stations on a um, on a server. So um, you know we in, in, a, in a cloud round you wind up with um, you know with basically just just the RF section in the tower uh, you know from the A to D's you know on. You packetize it. There, by the way, there are even standardized packet formats for, for doing it. I mean, you can use Ethernet, but the comms guys, true to form, have, the, have their own packet format. So, you know, if you own the fiber optic backhaul, you can run one of these um, these communication uh, standards. And you know, and and you know, from the ADB on, it's you know, it's software defined radio. And of course, you're you know, you're implementing uh, the rest of the LTE stack. Um, or um, you know whatever whatever it is, so you completely you know I mean literally eliminate all but the you know the, the, the front end of the of the RF um, at the at the tower, and um, you know the potential is 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 there to really go beyond um, you know sort of the and, you know, original Bell Labs notion of, of what is a cellular network. Um, you know, the, the formal notion of a handoff can be potentially eliminated once you have all of the digitized antenna signals coming into the data center. Um, you have the possibility of running a very large MIMO um, uh, 
algorithm. So you know, you think of a you know of a client radio moving through this forest of antennas, and you run the computation that, that allows you to take the the contributions of all those antennas and, and add them up. Um, but the first thing is to get all the signals into the data center, and then all sorts of new opportunities open up there. Can you just keep the mic, Rob? You're saying it is a pretty serious computational problem. Well, yeah, and, and by the way, it was, it was not easy, um, uh, and we may have mentioned it last year, I mean, just getting the stack running um, um, in real time, right, uh, was, a, was a challenge. And, um, you know, there was, there was some, there was some really uh, carefully coded <laughs> sections of, you know, down in the, down in the stack, so you know, so you can run it in real time, and and faster processors just um, give you the opportunity to run more towers. It would sound like there may be some special kind of processing units you could add to future CPUs to speed. Uh, yeah, and in fact, I think um, you know, if you talk to the folks in the, in the communication infrastructure group, I think they may have a slightly different name now at Intel. Um, you know, they they have early. Um, you know, early version. I don't know if they have an LTE version, but they certainly have a 3G version where they actually have some custom code for. I can't remember what it's FPGA or something. They have some part. It's doing a low-level work. Our goal is not to have any specialized stuff. Uh, you know, the vector engines. You know, AVX2, AVX3. That you know, that kind of stuff is just what you need to run the algorithms. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. All right, Paul. And then we'll wrap it up with number one. Moving into a network. Justin, do you have any idea what kind of Intel processors are currently live on Mars? <laughs> I don't. I don't. That's not my department. <laughs> I'm not worrying about the deep space mission of our processors. I don't know. Well, Jade, any, any idea what's running on Mars? Okay, yeah. Do you know? <laughs> no, I don't either. So. We do know that Will I Am is broadcasting from Mars. That we do know. But is he but is he doing it with an Intel processor? We don't know. I believe he is. He probably said that in his contract. The director of Creative Innovation. Absolutely. All right, let's wrap it up with number one, please. So Jennifer Scott from Keith Weekly. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi. Um, talking again about the cloud rounds, I'm wondering, obviously you've been speaking about all the work you've been doing in China. Have you been working with any European partners at all? And in the UK, for example, where we're about to embark on 4G rollout, is there any discussions going there, or would that be something you'd like to do? Well, uh, the conversations um, we've had, um, you know, you know, globally, uh, I'm sure include you know conversations in the in the UK. You know, our focus is more on the you know the network uh, suppliers. And uh, as opposed to the carriers, um, uh, although it helps to have the carriers pulling, and I think that's why the relationship with China Mobile Research um, and you know and, and through them to you know China Mobile is so valuable because it, as you say, you know you get an internal advocate with the carrier that you know that then comes back to the vendors and and provides the pull for the technology. Um, you know, just my my personal sense. I haven't, you know, I haven't been in all these businesses, but the business I've had with the European um, uh, vendors, uh, and I won't name any names, uh, they've been relatively cool uh, to the idea. Obviously, they had a lot of, uh, you know, investment, uh, and uh, you know, and, and since you know, since you're turning radio access networks from what was largely a hardware business. To what will be primarily a software business, you can understand why they're why they're relatively cool about. It. Again, China Mobile and, and through China Mobile Research Institute uh, is you know is a big help and as um, you know as standards uh, uh, are you know are defined and there are groups within 3GPP that are that are active here. Um, you know I think we'll we'll continue to grow interest in uh, in Europe, but. Uh, you know, I would say for the moment, uh, the reception amongst the providers has been real, the, the system suppliers have been relatively cool. And with that, thank you very much, Justin. Okay. Thank Thanks you, everybody, everybody. for uh, covering ID.